Um, welcome today to this very special Committee for Sydney Global webinar. My name is Beck Dawson. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for um, the Metropolitan Sydney under the Resilient Sydney program hosted through the City of Sydney. And I'm really delighted to be partnering with the committee today to talk to and, um, and support their ongoing program on resilience. And today we're talking to Janie Bubishi, who is um, a really incredible uh, leader internationally in the space of city resilience. And we're just delighted to have her here. So thanks very much, Janie, for coming along. To start with, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, wherever you're currently joining us from. I know um, in New York, I had the um, pleasure to be there in 2017 and met on the grounds of the Manahatta people of the Iroquois nations. And, um, but here in Sydney, where um, certainly where I am on the Gadigal, um, land of the Gadigal of the Eora nation and pay our respects to uh, all the traditional owners of the different places where we're joining from today, those um, traditional owners past, present and, emer and emerging. So um, thank you to everyone for knowing where their country is and understanding um, how important it is in terms of resilience. Um, Today, we're really delighted to have Janie here. She's the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. She's um, oversees a really ambitious program using science-based analysis, policy and program development to really ensure New York City is going to withstand and emerge stronger from really spectacular increasing uh, impacts of climate change, especially in the near and I think more the longer term as well, can some of the programs that we see coming it's a really timely conversation. Janie's had a, a spectacular and interesting career covering all sorts of different uh, parts of the system of thinking through what we need to change from my point of view. So previously was Associate Director of Climate Preparedness at the White House of the Obama Administration, has worked in, ha in Hawaii and worked in the Asia Pacific region looking at preparedness. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Program, which is a national body in the US, concerned with climate and science um, and changes obviously across their country and uh, you know been involved in a range of other really important community and um, I think global events that we have seen happen so bringing some fantastic experience to Sydney to help us understand and I guess learn from the experience that you've been gathering over so much time but um, we're really delighted to have you here thank you very much I'm going to hand over to you to start your presentation and we'd, we'll have some questions and obviously people if they're starting can think about questions you can start putting them in the chat throughout Janie's uh, presentation and we'll have some time to talk through at the end thanks very much Janie Thanks so much, Beck, and thanks so much for the to the committee for Sydney for um, hosting me and hosting this event. I'm really happy to join you all. Um, I'll dive into my presentation. I'll, I'll take about um, uh, 20 to 30 minutes to just talk through and give you an overview of the work that we're doing to build a more resilient New York City, and then really look forward to the conversation at the end. So please do um, post any questions in the chat so we have uh, uh, we'll have plenty of time to discuss them. Um, so next slide. Um, you know, I, uh, as Beck mentioned, um, am the director of the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency in New York City. Um, there I really have the privilege to lead an interdisciplinary team of about 30 uh, policy leaders um, coming from all different backgrounds, whether it's policy planning, um, uh, communications, legal backgrounds, engineering backgrounds, to advance a, a comprehensive approach to uh, climate preparedness in New York City. I'm gonna talk a lot more about what that includes. Um, but also, I just wanted to mention that we work with almost every agency in the city government. It's quite a large and complex government. Um, and we, uh, you know, partners are really critical to um, this effort, both inside and outside the city government. Next slide, please. Um, before I dive into my work in New York City, I just wanted to take a moment to um, describe how I got here. Um, you know, my work in resiliency really started in um, uh, Orissa, India, a few years after the 1999 super cyclone that hit um, Orissa. Um, Orissa is on the Bay of Bengal, and it was hit by, um, like I said, a super cyclone in 1999 that killed 10,000 people and washed away entire villages. Um, I was a college student in the US at the time um, and really didn't have much knowledge about this disaster. I ended up in Orissa on a fellowship to start daycare centers and communities below the poverty line. And you know, I was interviewing working mothers and no interview would occur without mention of the super cyclone that happened a few years prior. 
Um, it really, I think, struck me there that the most economically and socially vulnerable communities are also the most environmentally vulnerable, especially in the face of climate change. And it's that lesson that's really driven my work ever since. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I just wanted to mention how we got here. And of course, I think this audience is quite well aware that it's man-made carbon emissions since the Industrial Revolution that has gotten to, to this point that we are today. Um, this is a moment in my presentation that I also just want to mention that New York City has an aggressive uh, portfolio that's um, an, an aggressive set of actions that's working to uh, curb the rate of climate change by reducing New York City's carbon emissions through the building sector in particular, but also through waste transportation and other sectors. Um, that's not the work that I lead, but it um, is certainly led by our sister office and we coordinate very closely. Next slide, please. And the impacts of um, the, the uh, emissions, um, uh, man-made emissions are, are quite evident. Um, uh, this is a, a stripe chart that many of you may have seen before in one version or another, um, but globally in the US and in New York City, we're seeing trends um, that show that we're in for a hotter and wetter future. This was of course reinforced by the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the report that they released last week. Next slide, please. So just wanted to give you a bit of context of um, what uh, New York City is facing before I get into um, the climate change impacts in particular. Um, you know, we have 8.6 million New Yorkers now. Um, it's quite a large and diverse population across five boroughs. Um, that number is also growing. We're expected to hit 9 million by the 2040s. Um, so, you know, one of the impacts of this is that we're sitting in an affordable housing crisis. And whereas we're thinking about adapting to climate change, we're also very urgently trying to create affordable housing um, for our growing population. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have 520 miles of diverse urban coastline. So, um, you know, speaking in US terms, this is more than San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, and Boston combined. Um, the coastline is not only um, vast, it's also uh, quite diverse. So you can see some images here of neighborhoods along our coastline. We have a, about 100 different distinct coastal neighborhoods and the strategies that we need to adapt them to climate change are probably as diverse as the neighborhoods themselves. They include open space and recreational area, parkland, industrial areas, residential areas, historic districts, and we have to take all these specific circumstances into account as we advance our adaptation and resiliency strategy. Next slide, please. Hurricane Sandy, um, as uh, many of you may know, was really a pivotal moment in New York City's climate action work. Um, we suffered $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. 44 New Yorkers lost their lives. Close to 90,000 buildings were flooded. Over 2 million people were without power for several weeks. Um, and, and Sandy really kickstarted, um, uh, it, it, I should say, it maybe leapfrog some planning work that happened prior to Sandy into action. Um, and, uh, you know, it also unlocked federal dollars that were quite critical to moving all of that planning into action. Next slide, please. Um, so as we think about future Sandy-like storms, we know that um, we, we did some analysis with uh, the reinsurance company Swiss Re, and by the 2050s, um, a, a Sandy-like storm could actually cause $90 billion in damages and lost economic activity, which is nearly five times Sandy's impact. So um, we know that uh, future storms are going to be more intense and more expensive. Next slide, please. Um, we're not only, of course, preparing for um, extreme events like another Hurricane Sandy, we're also preparing for the chronic impacts of cl climate change. Um, one of these impacts is sunny day flooding. Um, this is when, uh, due to sea level rise, we see flooding um, uh, during high tides. Some of this is because uh, water is actually overtopping um, our, our coastal edge. But we're also seeing sunny day flooding because water comes up through the sewer system and actually um, inundates inland neighborhoods. So um, this is a, an image of an inland, um, uh, inland neighborhood um, and uh, one that is quite low lying and experiencing sunny day flooding um, uh, now. Uh, and we expect, of course, that will worsen as sea levels rise. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
Um, while we're waiting for the next slide, I also will just mention that we're expecting up to 30 inches of sea level rise by the 2050s. Um, I, I didn't mention this before, but we work with an independent panel of climate scientists called the New York City Panel on Climate Change. They're appointed by um, the mayor and provide us with local climate projections every three years, which is uh, mandated by local law. So, um, uh, you know, we have the, the benefit of using those climate projections as the foundation of our entire resiliency portfolio. They cover the 100 mile radius around Central Park. Um, another impact that we're preparing for is extreme heat. Um, the days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit are expected to triple as the century goes on. Um, this, of course, is a concern because it will um, most it will disproportionately impact lower income neighborhoods and communities of color, um, neighborhoods where there's less vegetation, uh, more density, and uh, less social cohesion. And it will also impact some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, the elderly, chronically disabled, um, and and so on. So we're um, uh, focused on, on extreme heat as a core piece of our resiliency portfolio, and I'll explain more in, in, uh, as the presentation continues. Next slide, please. Um, we're also uh, concerned about extreme precipitation. Now, precipitation um, is expected to get more intense. Um, it, of course, is another source of flooding like coastal storms and sea level rise, but um, it, we're concerned about this in particular because it can impact inland communities um, uh, which are often less aware of their flood risk and less prepared. Um, so the set of solutions that we need to deploy to prepare for extreme precipitation often look different than the solutions that we might use to prepare for coastal storms or sea level rise. Um, we uh, you know, want to make sure that we're thinking about this in its own uh, context, um, which is why uh, uh, I'm mentioning it here. Uh, next slide, please. So as we think about this uh, range of risks and hazards that New York City faces, um, we really believe that we have an opportunity to uh, reimagine the waterfront, invest in underserved communities and create, a, create safer and more vibrant neighborhoods. Um, there are lots of solutions that we could deploy if we were just concerned about safety first and foremost, but we're hoping that we can take a broader approach to resiliency and really improve quality of life in many New York City neighborhoods as we invest in adaptation and resiliency. Next slide, please. So the strategy that we are deploying in New York City is really a multi-layered approach. Um, we're of course focused on the coastal edge, um, coastal strategies because we have so much coastline um, and coastal risks are um, uh, very much front of mind. Um, this includes building a new class of infrastructure, which I'll describe more about, but it, it also includes other sets of solutions, including land use solutions. We're also focused on upgrading our buildings, um, making our buildings more ready to withstand climate impacts. Um, we are also investing in our critical infrastructure and services. Um, this means that we're coordinating with private utility providers, um, as well as um, other levels of government and city uh, service providers. This includes energy, um, wastewater, water, sewer, uh, transportation infrastructure, as well as telecommunications infrastructure. And then we are uh, finally doing outreach to residents and businesses to make sure that they're better prepared and, um, and, and can make informed decisions in the face of climate change. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to focus on coastal strategies um, in particular, and then I'll, I'll go through some of the other layers of our uh, multi-layered approach. But coastal strategies, um, I think, are important to mention because they have been, um, they have received, I think, the most attention out of any of the um, work that we have been doing in our resiliency portfolio since Sandy. Um, we're really building a new class of infrastructure as part of our coastal work. And I think there's some important lessons that um, we can pull out of some of the projects that we're advancing, which is what I'd like to do now. So next slide, please. The Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project is one example um, of a, a coastal uh, project that we're working on. It's a project that's moved into construction. Um, so it's in construction now. It's a two and a half mile long coastal protection project that will protect 110,000 residents on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 28,000 of whom live in public housing. 
um, you know, we wanted to, again, make sure that we weren't walling ourselves off from the water. So this project actually, much of the footprint of this project overlaps with East River Park. So we're actually raising the park about eight to 10 feet and we're building the coastal protection at the water's edge. So once the coastal protection is built, you'll, um, if you're in the park, you'll still have waterfront views um, and uh, you won't feel disconnected from, from uh, the water. Um, the rendering that you see here, of course, is, is an image of the work that's happening, um, of what the park will look like once the, the um, uh, coastal protection project is built. Um, you know, uh, we're also uh, replacing some of the waterfront bridges that lead into the park. If in, in this rendering, you can see that the park basically abuts a highway. Um, it's a four-lane highway um, that's right next to the park uh, and between the park and the residential buildings that are on the other side um, of the highway. And so there are bridges currently right now that um, you know, uh, facilitate access into the park, but they're um, quite difficult to navigate if you have a stroller or a wheelchair. So we're replacing those bridges with bridges that are much more inviting, that will provide universal access and will provide uh, a much um, uh, more welcoming entry into the park. We also um, uh, saw this as an opportunity, saw this project as an opportunity to uh, uh, make improvements to the park, um, improvements that uh, the community really um, uh, shaped. Um, for example, uh, you know, the park already has courts and uh, fields and tracks and all of that amenities that the community really appreciates and values, but um, they're all fenced off and the community really wanted to be able to have space, um, interstitial space, I should say, uh, to gather and um, have picnics and uh, just, just um, uh, be able to um, uh, use more freely. And so we took that feedback into account and that feedback is now very much baked into the design of the new park. Um, I think that um, really underscores the lesson that we've learned from this project. Um, this is a, a project that's really been about community engagement. Um, it was kickstarted by a, a process called Rebuild by Design that um, the federal government sponsored after Sandy. Um, that process was really a community visioning and design process. Um, this was one of the projects that was awarded coming out of that process. Um, we received a $335 million grant from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is now a $1.45 billion project. So the city has quite a bit of skin in the game, I would say um, as well. Um, but uh, the community has been involved from the very beginning. Um, and and has even their involvement has even evolved into um, a more technical capacity. There's now an independent panel of technical advisors that can um, consult with the community going forward and into the construction phases of the project. Um, we expect the uh, flood protection of this uh, flood protection components of this project to be completed by 2023, and the rest of the project, including the um, the, re the uh, revitalized park, I should say, um, will be completed by 2025. Next slide, please. Um, the Rockway reformulation is another project that's in construction now. This is a project that we're partnering with the federal government on, with the US Army Corps of Engineers in particular. Um, specifically, phase one is in construction now. Um, phase one will um, build new uh, rock jetties, um, which are just uh, stone structures that are perpendicular to the beach and will keep sand in place. Um, we'll add new sand to Rockaway Beach and we'll build a reinforced dune, a dune that's made reinforced with steel and concrete. Um, as you can see from this image, and I should have started here, that this is a beach community. Um, the Rockaway, uh, Rockaway is a peninsula um, uh, and uh, this beach community faces the Atlantic Ocean. This is a community that was really devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Um, the image that I showed earlier was actually an image of the Rockaway boardwalk uh, washed into the community um, due to the, the storm surge uh, from Hurricane Sandy. And um, uh, this project will provide uh, future storm protection um, to this community. Um, you know, this project, of course, looks quite different from uh, what you saw in the previous image um, with Eastside Coastal Resiliency. And I think the lesson to underscore here is that there's really no cookie cutter approach to coastal resiliency. Every community has different site conditions, including its topography and geography, but also every community uses the waterfront differently, um, which is why, you know, really 
doing the analysis for every community, doing a unique analysis for every community, um, technical analysis, as well as conducting the community engagement um, is absolutely critical um, to making sure that we're advancing solutions that actually make sense for a particular community. Next slide, please. Um, the Staten Island Levy is another project that we're advancing with the US uh, federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, this is a five and a half mile long project that will protect about 21,000 people. Again, this is a community that was really devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Most of the deaths that occurred in New York City um, from Hurricane Sandy occurred on the east shore of Staten Island, which is where this project will be located. It's a series of flood walls, levees, um, uh, berms, um, that will uh, span about five and a half miles from um, on the east shore of Staten Island. I can go into the particulars, but uh, this audience may not be most interested in, in the particulars of Staten Island geography. Um, I think the, the lesson here is a lesson about governance and Beck and I were just chatting about governance before the event started. Um, so there may be some questions um, following uh, that I hope we can dive into, but um, you know, this project is quite complement, com complicated because um, it protects a critical facility, a wastewater treatment plant. It crosses a major street. Um, it abuts uh, beach and other parkland. And so there are quite a few agencies involved, um, uh, city agencies involved, as well as a partnership with the, uh, the state, as well as the federal government. Um, you know, while the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is building this project, it will be uh, the cities to maintain in perpetuity. And it's creating some really, um, I think, new and complex conversations about um, how we operate and maintain this new class of infrastructure that we don't have a dedicated agency um, to manage going forward. Um, you know, it, it's going to mean that we may say that uh, our Department of Transportation should operate and maintain the portions of the project that abut streets, um, that uh, Department of Environmental Protection, who manages the wastewater treatment plant, um, may uh, maintain the portions of the project that are critical to protecting the wastewater treatment plant. But this may not be the best way to um, manage uh, operations and maintenance going forward. And I think we need to also be thinking about long-term solutions in parallel, um, which, is a, which is what we're doing, um, but, but they can be quite complex uh, to navigate. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to also mention that you know, the projects that I described so far are all um, uh, complicated construction, you know, complicated infrastructure projects that take years of design and construction. Um, but we're also thinking about coastal flood protection on different timescales. And one of the um, strategies we've deployed to protect communities sooner is interim flood protection measures. These usually um, consist of uh, HESCO barriers, which are basically military grade four foot tall sandbags, as well as tiger dams, which are water filled tubes that we would deploy just in time of a coastal storm. These are um, protections that we're putting in place at the building level in most cases, but also um, at, at a neighborhood scale. Um, and they're deployed in about 50 plus sites across the city. Um, these usually take much less planning and design time and can be deployed quite, quite quickly. Um, and as you can imagine, um, they are quite inexpensive compared to the long-term protections that um, I've talked about so far. Um, so we're deploying these in, in most cases in communities where there are permanent protections planned, but while, while the process is ongoing and unfolding for the permanent protections, um, we are deploying these interim flood protection measures um, uh, to provide uh, a lower level of coastal storm protection um, for the communities in the meantime. Next slide, please. Um, and some of our uh, solutions are quite long term. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to particularly uh, highlight is our Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Program, which consists of several different coastal protection projects. Um, uh, there are segments uh, that you can see on this map um, that uh, uh, are actually quite similar to the projects that I've described so far, land-based coastal protection measures. All of them have different configurations of um, protection strategies, whether it's berms or levees or uh, uh, gates um, or whatnot um, uh, based on the, the uh, area that they're located in and the particular site conditions and waterfront uses. 
Um, but what I wanted to highlight here is, is the portion of this map that's titled the Financial District and Seaport Climate Resilience Master Plan. So the financial district in Seaport, this is where Wall Street's located, um, are quite important areas um, for our economy and our city. Um, you know, most of the subway lines in New York City travel through this area. Um, ferry connections are um, are located here as well. Um, so it's it's um, you know a, a, an area where there many jobs are located, um, and it's it's a low lying area that's vulnerable to coastal flooding. But because of its density, both above ground and underground, a land-based um, coastal protection is not actually feasible. Um, and so in our assessment, we um, came to a different kind of solution, which is to extend the land um, of this area into the East River and build coastal protections into the new land, basically build high ground. Um, so we're in a master planning process, which is essentially um, a conceptual design that will um, uh, move forward um, in in this uh, uh, the remainder of the, the Mayor De Blasio's administration, um, which is which ends at the end of this year. And then there will be much more work to do to continue to advance this project um, into the future. Um, but we're excited about this work. It's um, gained quite a bit of community support. Um, there are some uh, controversial uh, topics that I think we're still sorting out with the community, including um, how the new land will be used, um, whether it'll be open space or whether there will be development, new development located on the land. So those are active discussions with the community and we wanna make sure we take the community's input into account. Um, and then a big question will be how we finance this development, uh, finance the project, I should say. Um, you know, will it will it be government funded, and will there be um, federal funding that we can access, um, or um, will we have to look to other revenue sources? Um, development, of course, could be one of those revenue sources if we decide to go down that route. Next slide, please. And I just also wanted to mention that so far, you know, I've been mentioned, I've talk, been talking about all these infrastructure solutions um, to coastal resiliency, but another solution that um, uh, we are implementing and I think looking into more and more is um, a land use approach to coastal resiliency. So we've created a new zoning designation called special coastal risk districts, um, which are being applied to um, incredibly low lying communities where um, they're already experiencing tidal flooding on a regular basis. Um, this is an image of um, high tide flooding in a community called Broad Channel in Queens um, in New York City. Um, and of course these designations um, have only been um, reached uh, after tremendous community engagement. Um, and the designation basically requires that we limit density. So essentially we're not going to uh, make these neighborhoods any more dense than they are now because of the um, risks that they face. Um, so th this designation has been applied to a handful of neighborhoods across the city now. Um, and we're also in uh, parallel to the zoning designation we just recently introduced a concept called housing mobility. Um, we regard housing stability as an essential right um, of all New Yorkers um, and now are realizing that in the face of climate change, people may need to relocate, um, hence they may need to also um, uh, have the right of housing mobility um, in order to maintain housing stability going forward. So we've just introduced that concept and have started a conversation with New Yorkers about it. Um, and we'll be um, uh, expanding on that more going forward. Next slide, please. Um, so I feel like I've been talking for a long time. I just wanted to quickly mention some of the other um, uh, elements of our resiliency strategy and then look forward to the discussion. So I mentioned that building upgrades are a key part of our resiliency strategy. Um, you know, this means, this includes retrofitting um, existing buildings. Um, we've invested over $3 billion since Hurricane Sandy into our public housing buildings in particular to retrofit them um, so that they're prepared for another storm, including elevating electrical equipment, um, installing um, uh, uh, so doing, uh, actually floodproofing the buildings, especially on the first floor um, and things like that. Um, we are also improving our building code. Um, we've taken the latest flood risk information that we have um, and incorporated that into our building code. Um, and we're actually working on a new um, 
flood risk, uh, future flood risk tool um, that will be more property specific. And we hope that that information will also be uh, incorporated into building codes that we can actually take future risk into account. Um, what you see here is actually one of our extreme heat strategies. So we've been increasing reflective surfaces across the city through a program known as Cool Roofs. Um, and we're just essentially um, using a special white coating to, to coat uh, rooftops, especially in heat vulnerable areas um, and in, in dense areas um, to lower building temperatures. And when you cluster these cool roofs in a particular in close geographic proximity, they actually have the effect of lowering ambient temperatures. Um, so this is a public housing development um, in Brooklyn. Uh, you can see the difference uh, before the cool roofs were installed and then after. Next slide, please. Um, I also mentioned that we're upgrading our, or hardening, I should say, um, infrastructure and critical services to minimize disruptions during and after an extreme events. Um, much of this work is actually focused on uh, working with um, uh, regional uh, governance entities and private sector uh, utility providers and service providers um, to uh, ensure that we're taking into account future risk in um, the delivery of critical services. Um, the image that you see on the right of the slide is an image of a uh, report cover from our um, energy utility, Con Edison. Um, they've uh, released a climate ad adaptation plan um, uh, just earlier this year and will um, continue to uh, work with the city on um, uh, taking climate risks into account um, as they deploy their services. Um, the other image that you see here, the climate resiliency design guidelines, um, are actually a set of guidelines that we developed in 2017 and have been iterating on ever since. Um, they use our local projections for extreme heat, storm surge, sea level rise, and extreme precipitation and actually provide guidance to designers and engineers on how to incorporate those projections into, into the design and construction of all buildings and infrastructure projects that are funded by the city. Um, we actually were uh, fortunate to work with our city council this year to um, institute a mandate that these guidelines must be used for all city funded projects going forward. Um, and we hope that we will build on this mandate and expand this to um, uh, private uh, buildings and infrastructure going forward. Next slide, please. Um, and lastly, you know, I mentioned that we're working with residents and businesses to provide information so that they can make more informed decisions in the face of climate change. The image you see here is actually from one of our flood insurance outreach events. Um, flood insurance in the US is, is um, quite complicated and um, very difficult to navigate. Um, and so we have been working, as you can see from this worksheet, uh, to make flood insurance simple. We're um, helping people navigate the process, helping people get flood insurance, um, and also actually performing resilience audits um, in certain eligible households, low-income homeowners in particular, to make recommendations of um, uh, inexpensive retrofits that they can make to make their home safer and sometimes also re receive premium discounts um, for flood insurance. We're doing the same with small businesses. We're providing technical assistance um, and making uh, both operational as well as um, uh, kind of asset level uh, recommendations on how they can be prepared for um, uh, future extreme events. Next slide, please. Um, so the last thing I just want to say is that this work is really grounded in science and equity. So I had mentioned earlier that, you know, we work with a local panel of climate, uh, climate scientists. Um, I should say that they're physical climate scientists, but also um, are quite interdisciplinary. So they bring other forms of expertise into the mix that provide us with local climate projections. Um, but we also are taking um, demographic data into account. So this is just an example of how we're um, taking equity into account in our work. Um, the image you see here is of our heat vulnerability index. It takes um, physical characteristics of heat risk into account like density and lack of vegetation, but also social characteristics of heat risk like um, uh, race and poverty. We've overlaid all of that data to form this map um, and the areas that, high, that kind of light up in red are the areas that we consider most the most heat vulnerable. Um, so these are the places where we're actually targeting our investments in heat resiliency first, um, and we'll kind of go out from there. Um, uh, but we're also developing a tool like this for coastal vulnerability going forward, um, uh, which we hope will 
um, make more transparent our decisions around where to focus, focus coastal resiliency investments. Um, I have gone through a lot. Um, I think that's my last slide. So I will stop there and really look forward to the questions. I hope that's provided a helpful overview of our work. Fantastic overview, Janie. I know we're going to get a lot of questions. I've got certainly plenty. What an incredible job you're doing of covering those many different, uh, I guess, many different approaches to how you're tackling the, the scale of the problem. I think certainly my experience of being in New York and just seeing the scale of the you know, impact that you'd had post Sandy and some of the kind of what looked to me like really extreme measures people were starting to take to take, you know, their safety into account for future events. So you've got a, a very motivated population who've also had that experience fresh in the mind, I guess, too, um, which is something that we can we can certainly chat about. We do have a question already, and I, if I can just encourage everyone online to now um, focus on your little Q&A box, which is on your screen, and enter in any of your questions. I know there's lots of people on this call who I know um, will have plenty of questions, so please don't be shy, pop them up. Um, we've got time to spend with Janie to answer them. So the first question, Janie, is from Elise Cheney. In a world of finite resources and funding, how do you prioritise the resilience interventions, particularly coastal ones? And so is it based on population affected or protected? I mean, you mentioned that that's the process that you're starting to pull together now. Is there, are there particular, you know, is, is there an order about the way that you tackle that? Yeah, you know, I didn't talk so much about how our resiliency portfolio is funded currently, but, um, uh, you know, I, I know that in the marketing of this event, um, it was mentioned that we're advancing a $20 billion resilience portfolio. Um, so that $20 billion um, really was, um, for the majority of that $20 billion flowed from the federal government to the city after Hurricane Sandy. So it was disaster recovery money. About 15 billion of it was um, from the federal government. And the uh, I would say um, almost the rest of the five, uh, the remaining 5 billion is from the city. So the city's made certainly um, enormous investments as well. Um, but the reason I mention that here is because, um, well, first, first of all, I, we need to change that, right? Um, we need to be able to access more um, proactive uh, funding to be able to take proactive action rather than um, only be able to access this funding after a disaster. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm hopeful about um, uh, some of the conversations that we're having um, with the Biden administration and office and the infrastructure bill that's currently being considered by, by Congress um, and, uh, you know, really looking forward to um, uh, really helping to, uh, you know, set that as a norm. But, um, but, but I would also say that in terms of what projects were chosen, a lot of it had to do with what areas were damaged by Hurricane Sandy. Um, you know, we, we were always focused on the most vulnerable populations. So um, I talked about the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project um, and the Rebuild by Design Competition. Um, the Rebuild by Design Competition was a, 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 a process that was um, launched by the federal government after Hurricane Sandy. And it was put out there to um, really kind of uh, uh, get people to start visioning, thinking big, thinking differently about what resilient solutions could look like in the areas that were really um, most affected by Hurricane Sandy. The, the proposal that was um, uh, eventually accepted was actually a much bigger proposal. It was called the Big U. And, you know, um, I, I think uh, folks who have been in, this, in the resiliency space for a long time are quite familiar with the Big U. It was a, a vision to um, protect the entire tip of Manhattan. Um, from Hospital Row, uh, for those of you who know Manhattan, um, which is around 35th Street, um, on the east side, all the way up the west side. Um, and, um, you know, the only part of the, the vision that was funded was the east side uh, coastal resiliency project. And a big part of that was because um, this is a low income area, 28,000 people live in public housing. Um, and so uh, the US Housing, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which was um, the grantor, um, really wanted to focus on protecting low and low and moderate income populations. Um, as I mentioned, we're trying to develop a coastal vulnerability index now. It will look different from our heat vulnerability index because we have to take different factors into account. Um, but um, you know, we, we're we're working on developing that uh, so that going forward, when the city is proactively applying for projects, um, we can uh, be transparent about why we're making the decisions that we're making. <laughs> 
Yeah, really interesting. And, that, and we see that um, working well here in parts of Australia where the, the preemptive work of engaging with the community enables that prioritisation to really make sense politically and um, in a kind of social licence to operate way with communities where some of that decision making is clear and articulated. It's a lot of work to get done as we, you know, I know only too well to really, you know, that community engagement work, the quality of that um, relationship with the community over that really longer term starts to become to the fore as being the really important part. We've seen that post the bushfires here in Australia as well. I mean, I'm standing here just listening to your numbers. This scale of investment is breathtaking, right? Um, for I think for all the Australians, I'm talking, we're looking at millions and you're talking about, I mean, we know that we've got to get there too, but we're not there yet on the dollars. But what I'm really interested in is it feels like a lot of it's a, you know, we're going to buy our way or invest our way out of the challenges that you're seeing. Like I'm not hearing a big retreat policy and big chunks of the areas where, to me, certainly, um, from my experience, looked really fragile or really vulnerable in some areas. Not yet, but it seems like you're working your way with some of those limiting density and looking at those policy pieces. Do you imagine a retreat policy being something you might entertain down the line? Yeah, you know, I mentioned that we're starting to think about housing mobility, and I think we're we're being very intentional about the words we choose because retreat sounds so top down um, and government mandated, and we really believe that as we think about voluntary buyouts as a um, uh, kind of a, a, a one of the, the, the core strategies, um, we really need to make sure that we're met, we're being very upfront that it has to be um, an engagement with communities. It has to be a community conversation. It's going to be individual decisions, and it won't be government mandated, right? It'll just be an option based on um, individual households. Um, risk tolerance, essentially. Um, and so, you know, we've conducted, we definitely, there, there was money from the federal government to conduct buyouts after Hurricane Sandy. So there are communities that have accepted buyouts. We've learned a lot of lessons um, from those programs. Um, uh, there were some, there are some neighborhoods where the buyouts were, were quite patchwork. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, certain communities, um, certain households accepted, certain households didn't. Um, and so you'll see kind of vacant lots um, in those neighborhoods. Um, there's some communities where um, resident organizing was um, a really key factor into um, uh, convincing more residents from a particular neighborhood to accept the offers. And, um, and so we have, uh, you know, uh, sort of large chunks of open space in certain communities now um, where uh, there was just a higher level of buy-in to the buyouts. Um, I, I think um, what's important to mention here, though, is that we're finding that um, a lot of you, you can see a range of coastal resiliency strategies in the same neighborhood. So let me just um, provide an example. So uh, there's a community called Edgemere in the Rockaways on the Rockaway Peninsula. I showed a, a kind of an aerial image of, of the Rockaway Peninsula earlier. Um, and it's on the, on the Jamaica Bay side. So not on the Atlantic Ocean, but the other side of the Rockaways. And this is a community that was low lying, um, experiences regular tidal flooding and ponding now, certainly experienced a lot of damage from Hurricane Sandy. But we're finding there, we, we actually, uh, you know, launched an integrated planning process where we um, considered these climate change effects that this community is already facing, but all, also considered other quality of life impacts um, uh, that these community that this community is facing. Um, lack of vibrant commercial corridors, lack of transportation access, those kinds of things. And we took all that into account when we developed a resilience plan. And what we're finding is that um, you know, just in this one neighborhood, we are building coastal protection. Um, there will be protection at the water's edge. It will be uh, for more frequent storms, not a, you know the hundred-year storm protection, but there will be coastal protection. We offered buyouts um, as part of our post Sandy buyouts to the homeowners that were right at the water's edge because they're already experiencing um, frequent flooding from wave action. We are designating a special coastal risk district in an area, um, in the area kind of at the, the layer in, further inland after that, um, where we're limiting density. And then further inland, uh, even further inland, we're actually building affordable housing. Um, and we're building that affordable housing with the latest building codes in mind. Some of um, our best examples of resilient design are located in this neighborhood. So it's just in one, one a relatively small neighborhood that we're seeing all of these strategies play out. And it, it strikes me that, you know, we're going to be, it, it might play out in, 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 in an equally nuanced way in other neighborhoods as well, where you see kind of a mix of strategies and it, it, and it just differs block by block.
Fascinating. It reminds me of uh, the early days of trying to look at climate emissions mitigation thinking where we started to go, oh, what do we need to do now? But then as we got more sophisticated, we started to make really longer term plans about that life safety, property protection, you know, land use uh, decisions and then work backwards from them. And so I can see that with your land use strategy starting to come in place, but then five years later, you're really mandating them, like you're putting them in place, preparing the community for the transition, but really not forcing the, the point until a little bit later. Um, we, I think, you know, have a lot to learn here in Sydney and New South Wales about the way in which we can do that. You know, we've just got a, a new um, set of planning rules being determined and resilience and sustainability are an important part of those. But it's that long range vision for where we're heading that I think we can certainly learn from your experience of bringing all the professionals on board to help us do that, that long range thinking. So thanks for that example. I was going to ask about, um, I think, you know, how do you measure it? How do you understand where you've nailed it when you like you know that you're making those changes going forward? Um, there's a really good question here from Karen Jones. Um, can you share your monitoring, evaluation and reporting process to determine the success of your projects and what's showing you being successful, like particularly about things like urban heat, which we're suffering from and trying to understand ourselves in our city? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this is a perennial challenge in the resiliency space. Um, and on urban heat in particular, um, you know, we have been, uh, we, we've actually launched a, an extensive indoor and outdoor temperature monitoring network. Um, so we had a bit of a break last year due to COVID, but for the past several years, we've been um, installing heat sensors in, in homes, um, uh, in social infrastructure facilities like libraries, cooling centers, um, things like that, um, as well as outdoors on like trees and lampposts. Um, and we're collecting data. Um, th this, this temperature monitoring is, is happening in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods. And it's also, you know, the neighborhoods where we're implementing um, strategies like planting street trees or uh, targeting cool roofs coatings. Um, and also things like um, social cohesion uh, efforts where we're um, sort of pairing up uh, volunteers with um, vulnerable residents to make sure people are checking in on each other during extremely hot days, but that doesn't affect the temperature monitoring. Um, but but the uh, but the data, you know, it, it's going to take some time, of course, to really understand the impact um, of our interventions. Part of the goal of the temperature monitoring is just to set a baseline, so that's part of what we're doing. Um, but we're already learning. Um, I think we're already gathering insights, even though it's quite early. Um, one insight we've we've understood is that. Greening is the most effective strategy um, to reducing temperatures. Um, places where um, there are trees um, and clusters of trees um, are the coolest. There are several degrees difference um, between greener neighborhoods than um, neighborhoods that lack that vegetation. Um, the other thing that we've learned is that indoor temperatures um, well, uh, let me mention outdoor temperatures first. Outdoor temperatures, we know peak usually in the afternoons and then kind of drop off, but indoor temperatures can actually maintain, um, a, 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 can uh, stay pretty high and, and maintain um, uh, that high level um, uh, for up to 16 hours, um, which is, you know, uh, uh, really underscores why we're so concerned about people inside their homes, especially if they don't have air conditioning. Um, so, you know, we're doing everything we can to reach these people, especially people who have may, may have mobility challenges and things like that, um, and may not be able to access a, a safe, cool space. Um, and sometimes people don't even know that they, they don't realize they're getting sick from the heat. Um, so I mentioned this program where we're um, connecting volunteers with residents. Um, we, we're also trying to um, reach people where they're at through home health aids. We're, we're training home health aides to detect early signs of heat illness. So when they're just checking in on their patients and making their normal rounds, they, they know that um, they should also be um, looking out for heat, signs of heat illness, especially on hot days. Um, so we're using strategies like that to um, be able to uh, check in on people however we can. Yeah, it's really interesting. We've been tackling the same challenge here in Sydney, but understanding the heat, what impact heat is having on the normal presentations of health um, impacts across the city and, for example, ED departments, um, really difficult to pull out well, what's the heat impact and what's normal you know, background or baseline. Um, at some point, you, I should definitely get in touch and we'll see if there's any other options. But I think there's a really evolving space and globally that all of us trying to understand what, what data points can we have? How do we create them to help us monitor and understand those impacts? We've got a couple of others. There's a good question here from Bruce Taper. The impact of the pandemic on a future resilience plan for social and physical planning of New York City. I mean, it's topical. We're all 
wondering where our cities are going to come back online here in Australia in a deep lockdown pretty much across the whole country at the moment. What do you see the impact of COVID on some of these? Um, have you thought that through yet? Yes, I mean, I think we're always thinking about it. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, what the final outcome will be. But I, I think that we've seen some positive developments during the pandemic um, that I think will uh, be in service to um, our climate action work, both on the mitigation side, as well as the resiliency side. Um, you know, we launched a great open streets program where we're um, uh, stopping, uh, we're barricading uh, roads that normally would have um, uh, high volumes of car traffic. Um, and these areas are now um, uh, for pedestrian use um, only. Um, uh, that's also uh, led to um, a, a outdoor dining program that um, is actually quite popular and I think will have some longevity in New York City. Um, we've also leveraged the open streets program to designate cool streets. These are streets in heat vulnerable areas that have shading, benches, um, other cooling features like misters and spray caps on fire hydrants and things like that. Um, you know, so that people have access to outdoor cooling space, um, as, which we thought, thought was especially important during the pandemic since um, uh, people may have been hesitant to um, uh, go into indoor cooling spaces, especially last summer, um, due to risk of COVID transmission. So I, I think that these are all elements of reimagining the public realm. Um, and, you know, I think it's very exciting. I, I um, uh, think these kinds of changes um, without a shock to the system like the pandemic would have taken a very, very long time to realize. And now we sort of feel like, you know, we can do this. Um, and I think it's it's um, forcing us to think more creatively and think more boldly. Um, so that's on the kind of physical side of things. Um, and the social, you know, I, I, I have made several references kind of obliquely to this program, um, which is called Be A Buddy, um, that connects uh, volunteers to vulnerable residents, um, vulnerable New Yorkers who are vulnerable to heat, heat, extreme heat impacts in particular. So um, elderly residents, um, those who are chronically disabled. Um, and so we, the city partners with community-based organizations to identify both the residents and the volunteers. And essentially we're um, uh, working with residents, we're working with the volunteers, training them um, and, and encouraging them to build relationships um, with the residents that are assigned to them. Um, over the course of the year. And then we're activating those networks on extremely hot days. Um, it's interesting, we activated those networks more times during COVID than any other time. And, um, and it, I think it goes to show that some of these investments that we're making in climate resiliency can actually pay off for all kinds of shocks and stresses that our cities might face. Um, and, and it also, I think, just underscores the importance of social cohesion um, and social connectivity um, for, for all kinds of uh, you know, um, different uh, crises we might face as well. Um, so I think we're learning a lot from that. Um, we've also, you know, you know, I think there's there's been a reckoning around racial inequities in, in the states that's overlapped with the pandemic. Um, and so we have been, the city has um, had, had a, a, an effort to focus on um, neighborhoods that were hard hit by the pandemic that also happened to be, unsurprisingly, um, communities of color and low income neighborhoods. Um, so we're very interested in um, you know, thinking about how we can work with these neighborhoods in particular to um, uh, build resiliency hubs and to um, invest in community preparedness initiatives that I think can be um, focused on uh, both health and climate and really think about the intersection. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, what's the what's the first pathway through to get you know investment to flow that really makes the strong business case? Um, I, I guess I would agree with you that we've seen that happen here too, where climate you know, adaptations are often the thing that seems most sensible against big infrastructure, but actually what we really need is the ongoing funding for those, you know, social and community programs to help support more broader stresses across communities as well. So how do we bring them together into some sort of structure? There's a question from Alison Witten about, you know, are we, you know, what's the process or can you see ways of getting that more business as usual, multiple benefits into some of the projects that you're doing? I mean, it sounds like you are, but it, they're almost not in the upfront business case yet. Is that true? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that's our goal, right? Our goal is to create a culture of resiliency. Um, and I think that we're always working towards that. Some of it is about standalone projects. Um, uh, and and I, I think the standalone projects are important because they they really do 
um, help the city build a new muscle um, that uh, we we don't have, you know. And so um, I, I think uh, they they certainly um, uh, I think have their impact in their own way towards this culture of resiliency. Um, but we're really excited about things like the climate resiliency design guidelines mandate, which I just spoke about earlier, because they really shift the paradigm from thinking about resiliency as a standalone flood protection project and instead require us to think not only about coastal storm risk, but also extreme precipitation and extreme heat risk across the design and, and, and construction of every capital project, every buildings and infrastructure project in the city capital portfolio. We have a $90 billion capital portfolio. And so, I, I mean, this is a game changer. It really starts um, mainstreaming climate resilience thinking um, and uh, starts sort of um, baking it into the DNA of how the city works. There's a lot more like that we can do, but it's a really good start. I, um, I can see a whole new breed of resilience accountants emerging across the globe as we cleverly and smartly work together across multiple disciplines to do exactly what you're describing. I agree it's the holy grail and it's uh, I think we're at the beginning stages of it, but I can see it's a long run that we all have uh, in front of us. I think um, community preparedness is probably the last question that we've got time for, but you know, it sounds to me like a lot of it's structural in terms of you thinking through your volunteering processes, et cetera. But, are you helping people do actual, you know, like local homemade, like emergency management plans or like localised structures? Are there sort of, is there local organisation happening in the community and are you supporting that too to kind of help regional or local connection work that way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our emergency management department um, actually manages those kinds of initiatives that are focused on individual and community preparedness. But one of the things that my office has done in partnership with our uh, Department of Emergency Management is um, just um, ensure, ensure that there's better connectivity around preparedness with community-based organizations, houses of worship, um, uh, faith-based groups, um, organizations that, um, you know, may actually end up being a first responder in a community after an event. They're also such important messengers to the communities that we're trying to reach. And so we certainly, you know, every year we do an urban heat preparedness training and um, the, the target audience is those groups, um, those groups that uh, might be able to um, just spread information and, and get information into the right hands about steps you can take to stay safe um, during heat season, um, things like that. Um, those are just some examples, but certainly um, community preparedness is a really important part. I didn't have time today to go into, you know, the details of our flood insurance outreach or a small business outreach. Um, the reason we're focused on small businesses is because we really see them as community anchors. Um, you know, they, um, you need the, the pharmacy open or your local hardware store open or or um, in New York City, we would say the local bodega open on the corner um, uh, to get the supplies you need to just survive often um, and certainly take the first steps towards rebuilding after an extreme event. So um, that's why we're working um, with, with local businesses as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, we, the volunteering piece of this is it shouldn't be underestimated, right? I mean, I think um, uh, social cohesion, like I said, social connectivity is so important um, in, in this context. And, um, you know, the, the volunteer networks are a piece, a, a part of that. I think resilience hubs is something that we're increasingly exploring, just places that we can gather. Um, that communities can gather. We, we are increasingly thinking of social infrastructure as its own class of infrastructure. And what right. I mean by that is libraries, um, you know, community centers, senior centers, places where um, people will go um, if they need help uh, because they're, they're places that they frequent and places that they, um, uh, people and they're people that they trust in those places. So, um, you know, uh, I'll stop there because I know we're out of time, but. Um, we are. Uh... Janie, I think we could talk for a lot longer. Um, it's fantastic to just have your um, experience and uh, to really see the scale of what change you're trying to make in New York City is just really inspiring for all of us here in Sydney. Um, we are, will definitely uh, take some of the lead from you on some of those parts, but I just think the mandates that you're cl you know, clearly articulating as a government, the engagement with those private sector actors who can do something about it, and obviously your ongoing conversation relationships with the community on all those fronts with resilience, you're doing a fantastic job thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and coming to share it here with us in sydney we look forward to collaborating with you and uh, learning more from you as we go through thank you so much thanks for having me good on you thanks very much everyone for your questions we got through most of them and um, thanks to the committee for sydney for hosting this great event today all the best <laughs>